Um, thank you for joining us. Lindsay's beautiful book, Art and Flower, Finding Inspiration in Art and Nature. And we'd like to thank the Friends of the Library, the Barrett Bookstore, and the Garden Club of Darien for participating in this program this morning. Please, is it work? Please silence your phones, and we'll take questions at the end. Let me tell you a little bit about Lindsay. Lindsay Taylor is the founder of Lindsay Taylor Design, which creates gardens and landscapes for public and private clients throughout the Northeast. Lin Ta Lindsay, they put you down as Taylor. Uh, Lindsay is the former garden editor of Martha Stewart Living, Domino, and Garden Design Magazine, and her work has appeared in the New York Times, T Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, and Gardenista. Her website is also really beautiful, so check that out. For nearly a decade, she produced, wrote, and styled the journal's well-loved Flower School column in its off-duty selection section. Sorry. Hello. Thanks for coming, everyone. I want to thank the Darien Library and the Garden Club, the Darien Garden Club, and the Barrett Bookstore for putting this together. Um, so I'm just going to take you through a little bit about me and how this book came to be, and my a little bit on my process. Okay, so um, here's so we just started with that little uh, little video of a simple arrangement. One thing about the column you'll see as I move through these slides is that uh, these arrangements were very Im very spontaneous. I didn't spend a lot of time overthinking them, and the whole idea of the column was to get people to feel you know take the fear out of flower arranging, to feel free to do something simple, bring a little bit of their garden, the outdoors, something from a walk inside, that it's not all about having to shop for expensive flowers. And it was always um, inspired by a work of art. My one challenge with, with for myself, and um, which made this column a lot of fun, was that the work of art should really have nothing to do with flowers, like not a copying a Dutch. It's fun to copy a, a Dutch master arrangement, um, but uh, and I've done that before, and it's a great it's a great exercise actually. But for this column, I chose works of art that had really had nothing to do with flowers, uh, just to make it more challenging, to make it about the colors, thinking more about color, rhythm, gesture, texture, that sort of thing. So just a little bit about me. There I am in my studio. Um, I, primarily, I design gardens for clients now. And uh, there I am cutting um, for arrangements with my pup, Lucy, who's now 105 <laughs> in human years <laughs> and doing very well. <laughs> And um, just, uh, you know, I was in publishing for a long time, as they mentioned, when I moved here from Toronto. Uh, I soon after uh, became a garden editor at Martha Stewart Living Magazine. In the early days, uh, there was only about 60 of us at the company at that time, so we were involved in everything. And I primarily did most of the flower arranging for the stories and the covers, and that's where I got to really play with that. And then I went on to do floral styling for clients and... Uh, various uh, publications and writing for different publications as well, always to do with gardening. And here's just a little bit about my uh, design, my uh, garden design work. And uh, oops, just the process there in my studio. Uh, this was one of my first gardens in Brooklyn, New York, in Brooklyn Heights. Um, and I am doing less work in the city now, but at the time I was doing primarily work in uh, Brooklyn and rooftops in the city. And just, you know, different size gardens, different conditions. The one in the mi middle is a real pocket garden, deep shade. Um, we really lightened it up with using that pea gravel. And rooftops. A lot of my gardens, I realized as I looked at the pictures, really started to to, I realize there's a sort of consistency about this kind of contained space and then this explos explosion of plants. And it's kind of like an arrangement in itself. And then we would get, we, you get in there and you kind of edit and you, you keep massaging a planting like this over the years. You can't just let it be. And the same happens with arrangements. Once you put all the flowers in, you're you know, moving things out or trimming leaves off just to create more air and create better, better rhythms. That's um, my last garden, my, my own garden in the city on the, on the right side, my last little laboratory. And that Graham Thomas rose actually came out of a dumpster and uh, is still thriving at a friend's garden in Brooklyn. 
great rose. And this is a garden I'm still working on. This has been about, I've been working on this project maybe six, six years now. This is um, up in Garrison where I live for a client. And again, that contained space with this sort of madness of, of textures and flowers that works through the season. Uh, this is just one of the sections of the garden. These are, there's two 14-foot square beds with a path through them. And this is another view of that from another side, letting the plant spill into the gravel uh, and spill over the edge. And that, that repeats in my arranging too, and you'll, I'll talk about that, how I like to see plants kind of cascade and break the edge of, an, of a vessel so that the flowers and the vessel become one. And that makes, what, in my opinion, a much more comfortable and attractive arrangement. Just a few more details from that garden. And this, you know, I, I tend to like things almost on the verge of going too far. Um, and uh, this is a wonderful clematis called summer snow that really blooms for a long time. And I love how it just looks like, almost like a forgotten garden. And my arrangements tend to have that. And then I love, I love verticals too, cutting through the sort of madness that give a sort of clarity to a space. Without those vertical digitalis, I think that would just look like a, sort of mushy mess, um, and they really help bring definition to a space, having the different patterns. So finding inspiration, I just want to talk a little bit about um, how, I, how I find inspiration, other than looking at works of art. Um, I think uh, going out into natural environments, seeing how plants grow naturally in spaces is certainly important to my garden design work, but also to my arranging. This is uh, Cape Cod, and just noticing how the um, bearberry and the pitch pine grow, grow naturally in these, these big drifts and the pitch pine pu sort of punctuating the bearberry and this natural cow path that's been created over, over years from people walking and just that beautiful sinewy line. Um, I think, you know, I don't think you can do better than that for a garden design. And looking at all seasons, uh, this is in the winter, and again, this is a natural situation, but echoes that garden, uh, that section of my garden that you just saw with the digitalis. This is verbascum, but um, that same vertical giving sculptural interest to the sort of wildness below. Um, I work a lot with uh, looking at, when I'm working in my gardens, looking at what uh, is there naturally. This is mountain laurel and the rock where I tend to work a lot in Garrison, New York, which is very rocky and has that sort of natural landscape. And I just threw in a few pictures from visiting gardens over the years. This is actually Sissinghurst Garden. And, uh, and uh, I put this picture in because it's the backside. It's the spot where nobody goes. And I just like to encourage people to go off the beaten track and not just go on the normal path. Um, and I just think this is a wonderful view, different kind of view of Sissinghurst Garden. And looking at gestures, um, in this is grave tie and great dixter, just sort of you know different color connect, uh, combinations, um, patterns, the ge geometry mixed with the sort of mad plantings. These beds are incredible at grave tie; they're really packed. But then there's this wonderful geometry through the garden that keeps it balanced. And then just going into my um, column, which was called Flower School for nine years in the Wall Street Journal and now is in book form, uh, a section, you know, a small bit of what I did for the nine years every month uh, is in this book, Art and Flower, that just came out. And um, this is what the column looked like, if, you, if you, didn't, you weren't aware of it. So every month I would take a work of art that related to the season that we were in. So I would think about the colors that are out there and also um, possibly was a show that was on somewhere in the world. So I would research what was happening out there and hopefully get to see the work of art myself. Sometimes I didn't, but, um, and I would take the work, I would choose the work of art ahead of time and bring a copy, a color copy to the garden, to a friend's garden, to the flower market, and really that morning that I was shooting, so it would all happen really fast. I would choose the vessel ahead of time, and I would, I would choose a vessel that made sense with the work of art because I really wanted that to become um, its you know, complete package. Uh, 
but the work of art, I really chose the flowers the morning of the shoot to keep it spontaneous and fresh and to not overthink it. The book is organized by season, so I'll just take you through a few, um, just thinking about spring and what's happening in the gardens at that time. I find there's a lot of fresh lime color in early spring, yellows, and this was one of the first, uh, first arrangements I did for the column. Just to, you know, to, I, used, uh, I chose the vintage glass vessels in a cluster to make it feel fresh, like you were just walking through this, um, this meadow and collecting little bits of flowers. Uh, these kind of vases, these bud vases, these vintage glass vases are great to have on hand just to showcase a flower in your house. You can spread these out across a table in a nice line if you're having a dinner party or a mantle, and they also look great clustered together. And just showing you different styles of arrangement. So it, I think if you start looking at my work, I think there's something similar about my style. I haven't quite figured out how to articulate that yet. Maybe you guys can help me. But, um, but I'm using very different types of works of art to push myself. So this Anne Truitt, very contemporary modern piece, uh, using the white daffodils as, a sl as the white slash of the work and a very modern vessel, but always as you see, the, see these pictures, you'll notice how I'm breaking that rim with the flowers so that the vessel and, and flowers become one. This was challenging at eight in the morning at the flower market, trying to decide what, to, what flowers to get, but I was lucky to find, if you can just make out the lady slipper orchid in the arrangement, which um, emulates the, the uh, hummingbird on her necklace, similar kind of shape, if you kind of stretch your imagination a little bit, and the fritillaria, like the headpiece, and the little drumstick alliums, like the little insects, the dragonflies and butterflies, moths flying around, and then of course the tropical foliage really helped to pull that in, and then choosing a vintage deep green uh, vessel, glass vessel, and also very sort of, a very vertical like the portrait. Lot needed, wanted to do something a lot more in the style of Ikebana for this piece, and um, the chocolate cosmos brings to mind that her shape of her hair, the little mascari, the, <clears throat> the back of her kimono at the neck, a little bit of blue, the Gerber daisies, kind of this perfect shape like the uh, parasol. Very open arrangement, very quick, like a gesture drawing almost. I've been working with, uh, getting to know a lot of ceramicists and uh, that's been a lot of fun to work with their work and uh, this is a ceramicist on the west coast um, either finding pieces that they are already making or encouraging them to do pieces that, that work um, well with the work of art I was choosing at the time. So I've done collaborations with different uh, ceramic artists. This was a show that was at the Whitney, uh, some massive piece and had a lot of fun creating that one. Summer. Summer, we think of more pastels. We're getting into more color, uh, you know, a lot more flowers, a little more romance. The Deben corn. This is a, con uh, contem uh, sort of a newer artist, more, um, who just had a retrospect at the Whitney as well, um, and I really wanted to, I really wanted the arrangement to pick up on the movement of those guys dancing, um, use the um, pink uh, ranunculus and as his pants and the shape to try and recreate that shape and the eucalyptus to have movement so that it all sort of feels when you look, your eye keeps moving with the arrangement and the vessels just like your, it does in the painting. This artist has a wonder, Salomon Tor has a wonderful use of greens in his work. He's known for his greens and really wanted to play with that a little bit in the arrangements. Here I did kind of, you know, repeat the, the lilies. You kind of had to with this hawk knee, but then picked it up again, the lilies, to work for the phone and the cat on his lap and the beauty berry for the uh, sash on her dress or the, the big long tie to just cut through there. Um, the yellows for the book 
on the table. I'm not always trying to, and the vessels, of course, relate to the color of the, the um, shutters and the molding and the vessel that is holding the, the lilies and the paint. And we're not trying to copy these paintings. It's more to get you to loosen up, play with colors that you wouldn't necessarily use, create forms and shapes that you wouldn't necessarily think to use. It's a place to start. And fall, thinking about seed heads and winter, but there is. <laughs> and that's the fun challenge. Every morning I try to do a little arrangement, sort of like my little meditation. Just, I just find it relaxes me, allows me to think about my day, step outside. Even if you don't have a garden, going for a walk, a little snip there, you know, thoughtful snips. If it's not your property. Uh, Richard Serra, that was, that was challenging, but what I, this is at Dia, which isn't far from where I live, and I go to this, this room down in the lower part of Dia, the light is incredible in the way it plays ac across his pieces, the, court, the way the Corten has so much color really in it, if you spend time with it and go there different times of day, and really wanted that metal feeling in the arrangement, but also to pick up all the colors. Um, so using the, the the physocarpus, little devil, and all the different tones that it gets in the fall, and the viburnum berries to really keep it kind of masculine and, and of that of that corten feeling. And and this is a good example of like arrangement doesn't have to have flowers. And it can still be quite strong. And the Mogliani, I really wanted it to have that that elongated feeling. I was fortunate, this is one of the first vessels I ever had, um, ever purchased. And it was just, it was, and of, of course it has to be <laughs> for the Magdaliani. I mean, it basically has the shoulders. It could almost be, uh, it could almost work without any flowers in it to showcase Magdaliani, but uh, just very simple arrangement. And this little stuff, I was, I was in a bit of a panic for the colors for this the morning we were shooting this. And then I remembered on the drive into the city is a friend who grows a lot of dahlias. So at 6.30 in the morning, I texted her and said, I'm coming in, I'm coming to cut your dahlias. And she had the perfect shade of, of dahlias for this uh, Lois Dodd painting. And the Gerber, the white Gerber daisy was something I picked up that morning at the flower market, but I really needed something to, to catch that light bulb at the top of the painting, which really makes this painting a lot more interesting, a lot, you know, ask, it, it makes you ask a lot of questions. Why the bare light bulb? You know, without it, there's also this sort of, um, she, she uh, sort of slightly washed out a chair that used to be there. There's, this is actually her room that she painted. She, her bedroom really looks like this, and then she painted a painting of her bedroom. And Sheila Hicks was someone I wanted, always wanted to do for the fall. I kept pushing for this with my editor, and he wasn't really getting it. And finally, he let me do it. But I just thought something cozy, something that brings you indoors, textural. She's a wonderful text, te um, textile artist. Um, and then I wanted the arrangement to feel really tight, like a woven piece. I often like very airy arrangements, but in this case, I really wanted something that, that had that feeling of it being woven by flowers and was lucky to find the cotton at the stems of cotton at the flower market that morning. The chrysanthemum was perfect. Uh, the porcelain berry picked up that crazy turquoise blue. I had to do the Mona Lisa. <laughs> and thank you, uh, thank you, Stilby, for looking a bit like her fingers. And, you know, this is an example of spending time with a work of art and seeing things you hadn't seen before. I hadn't really noticed the blue in this painting. And when I, it came time to actually make an arrangement, I realized that's a really important part of this painting, the water in the background. It keeps it fresh and, and, and you know, it keeps it from becoming muddy, almost like the, the verticals in the garden um, keep it from, you know, being too kind of just a blur, and uh, so that delphinium really, I think, plays an important part in the arrangement, and that, just like the blue does, the water in the background there. And winter, uh, winter is one of my most favorite times of year, and there's always something, something to find to make an arrangement of. Those little tough hellebores never stop. That probably was February in my garden. 
seed heads, berries. Monochromatic arrangements are really fun to do, to play with just one color or tonal. I wanted to pick up the romance of this Whistler, wonderful Whistler that's at the Frick. Something more playful. I always did something a little bit playful in January. This would have been a January arrangement that's sort of a little bit seasonless, but kind of feels like a fresh start. And here's a great example of the monochromatic arrangements. I love that red on red on red. So just going to the flower store, the deli, or your garden, and just choosing everything in one color. And it will, there'll be a lot of color within that, a lot of tonal shifts. And then changing the, de the, the lengths of your um, cut pieces is important to create lights and shadows so that you know the, the roses are set back to create the darker tones in the work of art and you know and, and you create you you keep the eye moving that's a very important part of making a, a interesting arrangement this was a great show at the met of Valtone um, Valtone um, and uh, I really want it to feel interior to pick up the wood of the furniture the dark brown wood of the furniture the little bit of blue in the tile and the vessel on the mantle and then that pink in the carnation that I just tucked in at the end to pick up the little girl's dress and again you know reds on reds on reds so you have um, uh, Hypericum and is that Hypericum? No, the um, Heptacodium, Heptacodium seed head, roses, Amaryllis cut short. I love playing with a tall flower that you then cut short. And here's my studio. I have a few vessels. <laughs> it's a bit of a problem. Uh, but um, vessels do matter, and I do tend to use, I have used most of these. Um, and I think that, you know, containers or vessels are really, can really make or break an arrangement. I think it's really fun. You don't have to have as many as I have, but um, I do think uh, having a pitcher of some kind, a pitcher is the perfect shape. You can't go wrong with a pitcher, any kind of pitcher. As long as it, it has, it goes, it holds, it um, goes tighter in the, cent in the top like that. I mean, there's obviously more modern pictures that are more upright, those are work too, but this shape in particular I find you can't fail. And you just, you know, you just don't want your arrangements to look like they're being strangled. You know, let, let them cascade a little bit over uh, the edge of the vessel. Even in a modern, more upright uh, arrangement, I always cut something a little shorter just to, to rest on the rim of the of the vessel. I mean, there's an occasion where I'm just letting things be tall in a very upright container, sure, but I'm cutting different heights within that to keep it interesting. And then um, I love having bud vases on hand, any kind, glass bud vases, just something small where you can just tuck something, you know, you want to observe a little closer up and put in a bathroom or a guest room or on a bookshelf. Different shapes I like to have and play with. Bowls are fun. Glass is great. I'm using a lot more glass these days. Uh, you do have to think about your stems a little bit more. Um, but it's, it, I love the way that light works with glass vessels. Tools. I have also a few flower frogs. But the thing I use the most when I need uh, some kind of... I tend to not use any mechanics in my arrangements. I try to keep them simple and definitely I think by this point we all know no, no floral foam, no oasis, that's a no-no, but chicken wire, the floral chicken wire, the softer chicken wire is great to have on hand and can be reused and that bunched up and stuck in especially a, um, a, low, a bowl like that or a wider vessel helps really easy structure to help support stems and can be taped in to just stay inside, or sometimes you don't even need the tape. But always have that on hand. Always uh, use a clean vase, always uh, change the water, never any foliage in the water, always remove any foliage that's going to, any foliage on the stem that's going to be in the water. Um, odd numbers, just simple rule of thumb. 
I tend to know the rules of making an arrangement, but then just sort of forget about them and do what feels right. But it's good to, to learn those up front, and then you can play. I like to have snips on hand so I can do something like that quickly. <laughs> Keep them in your car. Was that in the book? Yeah, yes, yes, there's lots of information. And then just here's uh, a little, little video. And then, you know, the protea at the end, just kind of. And here's the book. So hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for coming. If you have any questions, yes. yes. How, what was your path to this? Um, what did you study? Oh, oh, going back that far. Um, <laughs> uh, Just your foundation. Yeah. Well, I, I, I always, you know, I always was interested in art and became interested. You know, I really became interested in gardens when I took a trip to Japan just after college. And I decided I wanted to be a landscape architect, and I was going to go back to school and study that. Um, that almost happened, but I, I took some summer programs at Cornell and MYBG, and then I ended up getting, and, and I did, well, I did start a nonprofit, which you'll read about a little bit, in Toronto, which did urban greening projects. So I started working with a lot of um, urban planners and landscape architects and horticulturalists and became really interested, but I, I tend to be someone who likes to go out there and just do it. Um, than, than study. My sister's actually a landscape architect. She's the academic. She's had many years of, of schooling, and she's a true landscape architect. I'm a garden designer. Um, so I've learned through training, um, just working with people and studying on my own. Uh, so flower arranging, I always did as a kid. And when I got to Martha, I just had a natural ease with it, and they saw that, and they just let me do a lot of the flower arranging for the stories. and. One thing led to another. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, we got to play with that more than you can in your own home to really make it relate to the work of art that we chose. Um, so I would, you know, in this case, I wanted it to be really clean and modern and pick up some of that sort of plummy tones in the Stella. Uh, and we didn't, and we wanted it to feel fresh and modern. So we kept the background white. In other cases, you saw you know, we were layering more materials to relate to the artwork. So it was really looking at the artwork carefully and thinking about that and, and how to not distract too much from the arrangement, but to just add something to it. Yeah. Did you choose that ahead of time too? That we did choose ahead of time. So the photographer and I would discuss that a little bit. Um, you know, we wouldn't go crazy overthinking it, but we would just say, okay, let's use this and this. And, and some of those are easy to access. Sometimes we would bring in a stylist just to get the those some of the bigger backgrounds, or I would have things on hand. Yeah. So you're not going to repaint walls in your house to match the art. Probably not. I don't know. You could, but <laughs> each time you do a different arrangement. <laughs> yes. Where are your inspirations for your vases? Like, where do you find them? Um, well, I started to realize I had a lot of friends. I mean, I love ceramics, and I've always collected and paid attention to ceramics. And when we were at Martha, the stylist would always introduce you to new ceramics, uh, ceramic artists. Uh, so it probably started like that. I've done some pottery myself. And um, I've just, you know, paid attention at, gosh, I don't know. At mag back in the day, it would have been magazines would credit various ceramic artists for plates, you know, someone who's making plates for food often is making vessels as well. So I've gotten to know them, I go to their studios, um, that sort of thing. Or, or, or tag, tag sales and, you know, random places. Oh yeah, that should be your next speaker. And he's right here in the room. His name's John Holmes, great garden designer. He's in a lot of meadows right there. <laughs> it's, it, it is a complicated process to do it properly, and it is a bigger, a bigger conversation. Um, it's a great, a great thing, and you have to be realistic about your goals, I would say, um, and how you want to approach things, you know, naturally or not. Um, 
It's challenging. I mean, when you say weeds, what do you mean? Like a field of mugwort or with berries, with fruit, prickly red vine. Japanese wineberry? Wineberry. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, get some long gloves. I have these gorgeous yellow rubber gloves I use that <laughs> to pull it. Um, yeah, every situation's different. So honestly, that, that would be it. That's a whole... Yeah, do another talk. John Holmes, right here. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I had the idea when I was at, back at Martha to do it as just a, a well story, we used to call them, the big stories in the main section of the, the magazine. And I kept, it, the idea kept getting rejected. They thought it sounded too strange and people wouldn't get it. So when I cut to many years later, and I didn't know about the whole art and bloom thing at the time, but there is a tradition in garden clubs and museums to look at a work of art and make an arrangement. It's been going on since at least the 60s, maybe, maybe more. And I actually wasn't aware of that, believe it or not, but uh, maybe I was subliminally. And then when I was, when magazines kind of crumbled and I was out figuring out things, I knew someone at the Wall Street Journal who had just redesigned the off-duty section and they needed ideas, they needed fun ideas. And I went to her with about 10 ideas and this one stuck and we we did it every month for nine years. I, I you know, the years would go on, I'd say, are you sure you still want this? But um, it was such a great, I mean, so great for me to have to like stop what I was doing, stop the madness and have to focus on this. and. Um, something I love to do, look at art, make flower arrangements, and that's really how it, it all came to be, and we had a good run. So maybe there'll be a second book, because I have so much material. <laughs> so let's hope this one goes well. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, it had, a, it had a really sweet fan base, too. I would get wonderful notes and... If, if we, you know, there was a, an odd occasion where we would miss a month or someone would complain, uh, complain the picture wasn't big enough and I needed to talk to my editor about how they were designing the section and yeah, it was really, it was great. All right, thanks so much for coming on this beautiful day. Let's get outside. <laughs>